Okay, uh, we will get started. So, the previous lecture wasn't recorded. I still have the video, but I don't have the audio for the lecture, so I'll have to re record the entire lecture and I'll put it up on YouTube. But meanwhile, now I have two factors of safety. <laughs> So I have a voice recorder and I have a mic which feeds directly into the video camera. So it turns out that the, the, uh, the receiver's connection with the video camera, that wire had some fault in it. So I had to go back and buy a new wire for connecting the receiver with the mic. So now it's working fine. And hopefully this won't happen again, but if it does, I have the audio recording so I can mix the video with the audio later on. But this is something that happens in cyber attacks. So I guess we should have been prepared with two factors of safety rather than just one, uh, just one uh, point of failure. So something to remember for the rest of this class. So continuing with our discussion, uh, we were talking about, uh, so what all things we have covered in the previous lecture, so that was on Friday. We talked about norms, basis, orthonormal basis, we talked about Continuity sequences, subsequences, continuity, differentiability, and we were we ended the class on differentiability. So let's pick it up from there. And today the goal is to try and cover almost all the preliminary material that we need. So we'll talk about differentiation, mean value theorem, Taylor series, chain rule. Then we'll talk about some matrix theory, matrices, rank, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, blah, 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 singular value decomposition. And then we'll talk a little bit about convex sets and convex functions. And that's it. That's the preliminary material for the rest of the class. In the next lecture onwards, my hope is to start with feedback control systems and optimization. OK, so we were talking about a function f that's a function from Rn to R, and we will be assuming that it is differentiable. And the derivative of f, this is something we talked about in the previous class. So then the derivative of f is a function from Rn to Rn, and it is given by Uh, the gradient of f with respect to x1, gradient of f with respect to x2, gradient of f with respect to xn, and then I'm going to evaluate the whole expression at the value x. That's this x here. We also talked about the fact that if your function f, or let me call it g, of x is g1 of x, gm of x, which is in rm. So this is all stuff we covered in the previous class. So I'm just doing a quick recap because we need it for the next, for computing the second derivative of f. So for this function g, the gradient of g at x was a matrix and that is given by stacking the gradients of individual functions as columns. And this matrix is, has n rows and m columns. Okay. All right, so this is, these are the two expressions we talked about in the previous class. Now, my goal is, the first goal for today is to compute the second derivative of the function f, right? So I can, uh, I can define the gradient of f as the function g and I can substitute the expression here. So g1 will be gradient of f with respect to x1, g2 would be gradient of f with respect to x2 and so on. 
So I can substitute that. And what I get is the second derivative of f evaluated at x. That will be the gradient of Okay, that defines a second derivative. And if you notice, this is a matrix with n rows and n columns. It's actually a square matrix. Okay. Any questions so far on this stuff? OK. Let's consider a function and try to compute the second, first derivative and the second derivative. x1 cos x2. So what's the first derivative? I'm, I'm just trying to come up with a simple function so that it's easier to compute the first derivative. What's the first derivative here? cos of x2 and minus x1 sine of x2. And now what's the second derivative? So in the first column, I have to take the derivative of cos of x2. So that's my first column. So what's the derivative of this with respect to x1? 0 minus sine x2. Okay. Now in the second column, I have to take the derivative, I have to take this function x1 sin minus sine minus x1 sine x2, and I have to take the derivative with respect to x1 and x2. So what's the first entry here? That's the derivative of this function with respect to x1. So that's minus sine x2. And then I have to differentiate this with respect to x2. So I'm going to get minus x1 cos x2. What do you notice? It's symmetric, right? So second derivative is not just a square matrix. It's actually also a symmetric matrix. So it's symmetric. So we now know how to differentiate a function of multiple variable. And we also know how to compute the second derivative of the function. Now, let's talk about any questions so far on this. So the second derivative of a function, as long as it's very smooth, like the second derivative is continuous and all that good stuff, it's always going to be a symmetric matrix. Now, why is first and second derivative of a function useful? Well, it allows us to approximately compute the function in the neighborhood of any point, right? And that comes from the main result, mathematical result is mean value theorem and Taylor series. So let's talk about mean value theorem. It basically says, 
I have x and b in Rn. I can write f of x plus d equals to f of x plus gradient f of x plus alpha d transpose d, where alpha is between 0 and 1. So for every x d in Rn, there exists alpha between 0 and 1, such that f of x plus d is given by this expression on the right. Remember, this is a column vector evaluated at x plus alpha d. So I have to take a transpose, take the inner product with respect to d. That's the mean value theorem. And then the second, this is, so of course, typically, when you want to approximate the function, you don't quite know what the value of alpha is. It's not very clear from the expression if there is a way to compute the value of alpha. So what you typically do if you want to approximate this is, you let alpha be equal to zero or alpha be equal to one. Those are the two easy options. You can also pick alpha equals 0 0.5. And you can approximate the value of the function f of x plus d with this expression on the right. It's just an approximation, it's not equality. If you pick some specific value of alpha, like 0, 0 0.5 or one, on the other hand, this expression, the mean value theorem says that there is an equality for some value of alpha, which is between 0 and 1. And this alpha actually depends on the point x and the point d that you have taken and the shape of the function and all that stuff. So it's really uh, not clear how do you compute such an alpha, but at least you get an idea of how to approximate if need be. Taylor series is another very good ap approach to approximate. It, gives, it can give you unlimited flexibility with how close to the approximation, how close of an approximation you want to get. So here, x and d are in Rn, and f of x plus d is given by a long expression higher order terms. So that is Taylor series. Okay. Now Taylor series is an infinite series. So assuming the function f can be differentiated infinitely number of times, you can continue this to as higher order of magnitude as possible. Of course, the third derivative of the function and fourth derivative and fifth derivative, all of those are very complicated functions to compute. But in theory, it is possible, right? So if you have a supercomputer at your disposal, I give you a complicated function f, which is infinitely differentiable, let's say a neural network. You can, in principle, approximate the function to any order of accuracy. Uh, this is two factorial, by the way. So you can approximate it to any order of accuracy by taking as many derivatives as you can and doing this multiplication. So this is mean value theorem, Taylor series. And the third thing that I wanted to cover, any questions so far? before I move on to chain rules. I'm, I'm, of course, not deriving all of this stuff. If you take a math class, the derivations will be done rigorously. So, but, but we are not going to go into any derivation in this class. It's all going to be matter of fact. So chain rule. So I have a function f from Rn to Rm. I have a function g 
R M to R. So I can do the composition, G composition F, and create a function that takes as input a vector in Rn and outputs a scalar. G composition F, this is the composition operator. G composition F is a function from Rn to R. Okay. Now the question is, I want to take the derivative of this function, okay, g composition f. How do I do that? Well, here is the expression. So the gradient of g composition f evaluated at x is given by gradient of f evaluated at x times, this is a matrix multiplication, gradient of g evaluated at fx. And if you recall, this is a matrix in m cross m. This is a matrix in m dimension. And this is a matrix in Rn. Okay. So this is how you define chain rule in in uh, uh, for for differentiating composition of function. Of course, you can have any number of functions: g composition, f one composition, f two. And in, when you take the derivative, you will have gradient of F2 multiplied by gradient of F1 multiplied by gradient of G. So the order of multiplication will be reversed in comparison to the order of composition of function. Okay, so that's something to remember. Okay, any questions so far? These are the three topics on differentiation of functions of multiple variables that we need to remember. Okay. Now let's get into the matrix stuff. So we have a matrix A, M cross N, the rank of A equals to number of linearly independent rows, which is also equal to number of linearly independent columns. That's how we define the rank of a matrix. Okay. So mathematically, of course, the rank is defined as the number of linearly independent rows. But when you look at, let's say you have a data set from an actual physical system. Um, and you look at, you stack the entire states that you have observed in the past as a matrix. So you have very large number of rows. You have a few columns, which is number of columns would be the dimension of the state space. Uh, what you will notice is it's approximately a low rank matrix, approximately, okay? So there is a low rank matrix which you can, which can approximate the system states that are visited over long periods of time. So 
So that is something to remember because in cyber attack detection, uh, one way to detect an attack is by measuring this rank of a matrix. And we'll get into it, uh, we'll talk about it when we talk about detection strategies in October. Now let's consider a square matrix. I can define the characteristic polynomial of this matrix as determinant of A minus lambda i. So lambda is the variable here. And if I take the determinant of A minus lambda i, what I get is a polynomial of degree n. And it's a polynomial in lambda. And it's known as a characteristic polynomial. So it would look something like lambda raised to n plus uh, beta 1 lambda raised to n minus 1 plus beta n equals to 0. So it's going to look like a polynomial in lambda. So we have a polynomial. We can find the roots of the polynomial or zeros of this polynomial. Okay. At which, oh, I have written it equal to 0. Well, it's a polynomial. It's a polynomial in lambda. I can set it equal to 0. And I can find n roots of this particular expression. And those n roots, lambda 1 to lambda n, These are roots of determinant a minus lambda i. These are also known as eigenvalues of matrix A. And they are, in general, a complex number. So they have real and imaginary parts. So you pick a random matrix A. Let's, let's just go back uh, and, and pick a random matrix A in uh, MATLAB, a random square matrix, and find the, the, the eigenvalues of that matrix, it's quite likely that you will find that the roots are complex numbers. Sorry, the eigenvalues are complex numbers. Now, since determinant of A minus lambda i times i is equal to 0, this means there exists a vector vi. What this means is it has a non-trivial null space. A minus lambda i i has a non-trivial null space, which means that there exists a vector vi in a complex plane, not a complex plane, but a complex vector cn, such that A minus lambda i i times v i is equal to 0, which is the same as saying A v i equals to lambda i v i. And this v1 to v n are known as eigenvectors. OK, any questions so far? All of you are familiar with eigenvectors and eigenvalues, right? OK. Now comes the case of symmetric matrices. OK, so we talked about uh, rectangular matrices 
In those situations, you typically define rank of the matrix. You can't really take determinant and all that stuff. That, for, in order to compute determinant, the matrix must be a square matrix. So we talked about square matrices. We talked about eigenvalues of the matrix. And we talked about eigenvectors of the matrix. If you have zero eigenvalues of matrix A, then it means that the rank of that matrix is smaller than n. So the original matrix A is a n cross n matrix. And I find out the eigenvalues. And I see that there are five zero eigenvalues. And then there are non-zero eigenvalues. Then it means that the matrix, the, the rank of that matrix is n minus 5, because it has five zero eigenvalues. So just something to remember. Uh, and it would be useful at some point of time. When you use MATLAB and you compute the eigenvalues of a matrix, sometimes you will find that the eigenvalues is 10 raised to minus 7 or 10 raised to minus 10. You can almost treat it as a zero eigenvalue uh, of the matrix A. OK. Let's talk about symmetric matrices. We just saw that we just saw that the second derivative of a function is a symmetric matrix. So the topic of symmetric matrices is very, very useful. So there are two reasons in this course why we will see symmetric matrices. One is when we are taking the second derivative of a function, and therefore we find a symmetric matrix. In other case, we will have a matrix A, a square matrix, sorry, a rectangular matrix A. OK, let me just write it. So first example is second derivative of a function. The second example is A is in R m cross n. Then A, A transpose, and A transpose A. These two are also symmetric matrices. In fact, it will turn out. There's, these are positive definite or positive semi-definite matrices. So we'll talk about it very shortly. So symmetric matrices are useful for, for the purpose of attack detection and uh, also for the purpose of optimization. So here are the properties of symmetric matrices. I'll just write as fact. So lambda 1 to lambda n are real. v1 to vn, they lie in Rn. So they are no longer complex vectors. They are real vectors. Lambda 1 to lambda n are all real numbers. They are no longer complex numbers. And third, v1, let's assume that You have normalized the eigenvectors so that the two norm, this is the two norm of the eigenvectors are all equal to one. Okay. So all the eigenvectors are normalized such that the two norm of the eigenvectors are equal to one. Then V1 to Vn forms an orthonormal basis. Has anyone of has any of you seen this before? These facts. Okay, some of you have seen it before. Many of you have not. The proofs are not that complicated, uh, but of course, uh, if we start doing proofs of all these results, it will take quite a bit of time. So we'll not do the proof. But uh, if you pick up any book on linear algebra which talks about Hermitian matrices or symmetric matrices, you will find the discussion about all these different things. Um, 
it just takes quite a bit of time to prove it in the class. So I stopped doing the proof long time back. Uh, there's a fourth statement as well. And the fourth statement is, uh, I'm going to define a matrix U, which is basically a collection of this n eigenvectors, okay, U. Then, U, U transpose equals to identity and U transpose U equals to identity. So U is actually a unitary matrix. So a unitary matrix is such that U, U transpose is I and U transpose U is I. That's the definition of unitary matrix. And if you stack the eigenvectors of a, of a symmetric matrix, you get a unitary matrix. Okay, any question? All right, let's move on to the next topic, which is positive definite matrix. So I have a matrix A. So this is positive definite if and only if A equals A transpose and lambda 1 to lambda n is strictly positive. So A is positive definite if and only if A is symmetric and all the eigenvalues are strictly positive. It's negative definite if A equals to A transpose and lambda 1 to lambda n is strictly less than 0. It's positive semi-definite if lambda 1 to lambda n is greater than or equal to 0 and it is negative semi-definite if lambda 1 to lambda n is less than or equal to 0. This is just the definition of different types of symmetric matrices that are very useful in optimization. Okay, any question? So when we talk about uh, cyber attack detection and when we will talk about principal component analysis, uh, we will usually use these two matrices. So we'll, we'll form a matrix A, then we'll take A, A transpose. We'll get the eigenvectors for that, stack them in terms of a matrix. We'll look at A transpose A. We will again uh, look at the eigenvectors of the matrix and we will look at the eigenvalues of these two matrices and then we will do some analysis based on that. Um, it will become a very easy task to detect a cyber attack um, when we use these eigenvalues and when we use these knowledge of these eigenvectors. Sorry, uh, these are eigenvectors and those are eigenvalues. So when we exploit the knowledge of these eigenvalues and eigenvectors, to detect cyber attack. Again, something to see, something that we'll see in October, not right now. Right now, when we talk about optimization, we'll mostly be focusing on this part of the symmetric matrix, which is second derivative of the function. And we'll talk about uh, positive definite and positive semi-definite uh, functions with positive definite and positive semi-definite second derivatives. 
So very useful concept for a variety of different topics within this class. Yes? Um, quick question about the cause of definiteness. Yes. Uh, if, if, I, if I can prove that minus A is positive definite, does that mean it's negative definite? Yes. And if there are like eigenvalues plus and minus? Right, then it's, it's just a symmetric matrix. They, there's nothing you can talk about. Yeah, you cannot say anything in generality. Yeah. Any other question? So the reason why negative of A, uh, so when you multiply the matrix by a negative number, the eigenvalues get a negative sign, but the eigenvectors remain the same. So that's the reason why negative A is a positive definite matrix. If A is a negative definite matrix, that's because the eigenvalues get multiplied by negative one, but the eigenvectors actually don't change. It remains the same. And it's also true that if V1 is an eigenvector, then minus V1 is also an eigenvector of a matrix. So the sign of V1 doesn't really matter. Any other question? Okay. Are you familiar with the term spectral radius of a matrix? No? Okay, let's talk about spectral radius. And a consequence of spectral radius being less than one. So I have a matrix A in Rn cross N. And I have the eigenvalues lambda 1 to lambda n. And these are complex numbers. OK, so I pick an arbitrary matrix A. It's a square matrix. So I can compute the characteristic polynomial. And I can compute the roots of characteristic polynomial. And I can get the eigenvalues of that matrix. Then the spectral radius. is defined as rho of A is the maximum maximum of the absolute values of the eigenvector, uh, eigenvalues. That's the spectral radius. OK. OK, so here is the result that uh, is good to know. So let's consider an iteration xk plus 1 equals to axk plus b. I get a sequence, so this x0 is some vector in Rn. So I start from some vector in Rn, and I multiply the vector by a add b, get the second vector x1, do the same thing, I get x2, do the same thing, I get x3. So I've generated a sequence out of thin air. So uh, uh, an important result is that this xk converges to an x bar, which is given by I minus A inverse B. So if I keep running this algorithm, not this algorithm, but if I keep running this iteration again and again, eventually I'll converge to I minus A inverse B. And the reason why this, oh, uh, sorry, I, I didn't mention this, the hypothesis. The hypothesis is if rho of A 
rho of a is less than 1. Sorry about that. So rho of a less than 1 implies that this iteration converges to a point x bar. Okay, and remember that this x bar satisfies, let me write it here, this x bar is equal to a x bar plus b because that's the limit of the sequence. So I can let k go to infinity on both sides of the equation and I get x bar equals to a x bar plus b. From here, I note that x bar equals to i minus a inverse b. Have any of you studied root locus? In, yeah, please go ahead. Yes. In case of a positive definite matrix, all the lambda values will be greater than zero. That's right. So how would the spectral radius thing help in? It will still be the maximum eigenvalue. Yeah, but it's not a radius. Like a, because your eigenvalue has more of Oh, right, right. So you are talking about the radius part. Where does this radius come from? So in general matrix, so, okay, let's. This is my complex plane. And I have a bunch of eigenvectors, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4. And I look at the maximum uh, absolute value of lambdas and all the eigenvalues are within this circle of spectral radius rho of a, right? So the radius of the circle is rho of a and all eigenvalues are within this, within this circle. So when a is positive definite, what happens is all the eigenvalues are here. And so the spectral radius is just this value. No, there is no significance. The two concepts are quite independent of each other. The, the reason why we talk about spectral radius is exactly this result that if you iterate xk plus 1 equals to axk plus b, then this system, I mean, this uh, iteration actually converges to a fixed point, x bar. That's the only benefit of studying, I mean, one of the benefits of studying spectral radius. Now, you might think about where did this, I mean, why is this iteration? It seems quite obvious, uh, probably. But why is this result useful? Well, this result, this particular result is invoked in proving that your uh, ODE45 solver in MATLAB converges to the actual, actual solution to the differential equation. Uh, so, so when you are solving differential equation numerically, this result is invoked in proving that result. Uh, when you are solving partial differential equations, again, this result is invoked in proving that you are very close to the actual flow field, let's say in uh, fluid mechanics. Um, in control systems, this result is used for proving stability. Okay, so how many of you have heard about, uh, or you may have studied uh, the root locus diagram. Okay, so you change the gain of a controller and then the roots move to the positive uh, positive axis, sorry, positive half plane. So that's the result in continuous time system. So if you look at the discrete time counterpart and you change the gain of a matrix of your, of your controller, it turns out that what you want is to get the spectral radius of A to be less than one. So then the system is stable and you will not blow up to infinity, right? So it's also useful in control systems when you're designing proportional controllers. And we'll talk about it probably in, on Friday this week, when we talk about PPI and PID controllers in control systems. Okay, so a lot of uh, 
lot of very sophisticated mathematical results actually come from this particular result. You have a question? No. Okay, so very useful result. Something to keep track of. Keep uh, sorry. Uh, remember. In optimization, we use this result to show that your optimization algorithm converges to the optimal solution. So it just has so many different implications, this particular result that, that um, it, it, you know, math is beautiful, so I, I can't help it. It has a lot of, like, simple results have a lot of implications across a wide variety of fields. Any question? Okay. Now, very quickly, I want to talk about um, convex, convex sets and convex functions. So I have a set A. No, I have already used A as a matrix. Uh, okay, X. So this is capital X, and this X is a subset of Rn. This is convex, if and only if, for every X1, X2 in the set X, for every alpha, between 0 and 1, alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 also belongs to the set capital X. That's the definition of a convex set. So typical examples of convex sets are x such that ax equal to b, x such that ax less than equal to b, x such that norm of x less than equal to 1 or less than equal to r. And you can pick any norm, OK? So we talked about different types of norm. No matter which norm you pick here, uh, this set is going to be a convex set because of the triangle inequality property of norms. Okay, so this is a convex set. Uh, what else? What else is a convex set? Oh, uh, we didn't talk about convex function, but x says that fx is less than equal to u is a convex set when function f is convex. So we'll talk about convex function shortly. But if f is a convex function, then fx less than equal to u is a convex set. Pictorially, here is a way to understand a convex set. So this is a set capital X. I pick any two points, x1, x2, and I draw a line segment. So every point on this line segment is alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2. And this entire line segment must lie within the set capital X. That's what it means for the set to be convex. So if you look at a set which looks like this, I pick two points, x1, x2, I draw the line segment. Because the line segment goes out of the set, it's not a convex set.
Okay, any questions so far on convex set? No? Okay. Let's talk about convex function. So f from Rn to R is convex if and only if for every x1, x2 in Rn, alpha in 0, 1. So this is the first definition of convex function. It doesn't require, it just requires the function to satisfy this property for all x1, x2 and for all alpha between 0 and 1. That's the first definition of convex function. Now let's assume that the function is differentiable, okay? If the function f is differentiable, and if this condition is satisfied, f of y is greater than or equal to f of x, y minus x transpose f of x, this has to be satisfied for all x and y. If it is satisfied, then it's a convex function. And then the third definition Third definition is if the function f is twice differentiable, then the second derivative must be positive semi-definite. Okay, so if any one of these three definitions is satisfied by a function f, oh, this has to happen for all x. So if any of these three conditions are satisfied by a function, then it's a convex function. Okay. All right. So that's all I have for today's lecture. Um, oh, actually, let's uh, if if we have a couple of minutes, we have one minute. Let me show you what a convex function looks like in uh, for function of one dimension. So a convex function has a positive curvature. So this is a convex function. This is f of x. This is x. So this function is convex. This function is convex. This function is convex. Uh, this function is convex. So all of these are examples of convex functions. So they have positive curvature, or in the case of this linear function, it has zero curvature. So by positive curvature, what I mean is the second derivative of f is non-negative. Okay, so it has positive curvature, or if it has zero curvature, as is the case in this linear function, these are all convex functions. All right, that's all I have. Uh, I'll talk to you guys on, we'll see each other on Wednesday. Thank you.